Today, we're talking about a child, age 7, who presents with worsening headaches. Now, here's where things get interesting. This child also has a history of seizures and delayed developmental milestones starting at age 3. So from the get-go, we've got quite a bit to unpack. Looking at the MRI images, let's start with the brain scan at age 7. The axial T2 weighted image shows us some pretty significant dilation of the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles. Yeah, this kid's got some big ventricles. There's also this high T2 signal paralleling the optic nerve, an important finding that suggests optic nerve involvement. You've got bulging optic nerve heads heading straight into the globes, which is just a textbook sign of raised intracranial pressure, or papilledema. Yikes! But that's not all, folks. When we switch to the coron weighted precontrast image, we see these bilateral intraventricular masses at the level of the foramen of Monroe. What does this mean? Well, the foramen of Monroe is a key point of cerebrospinal fluid flow between the lateral and third ventricles. These masses, which also show up in the post-contrast images, are enhancing like nobody's business. This enhancement suggests that these aren't just benign lumps sitting there. They're active. Let's rewind a bit to the MRI at age 3. Even at this early age, the axial T2 weighted images show subependymal low signal nodules, especially around the frontal, parietal, and deep white matter areas. And guess what? On T2 weighted images, we also see a lesion in the right posterior frontal cortex, a small but significant finding. It's a right posterior frontal cortical or subcortical lesion, although it's a bit hard to be super certain on this limited imaging. Nonetheless, it's showing marked low signal. So what do all these findings scream out? Well, it's tuberous sclerosis TS with large subependymal giant cell astrocytomas, bilaterally. Yep, these astrocytomas are causing obstructive hydrocephalus, which perfectly explains the child's worsening headaches. This isn't just a benign condition, it's something that needs immediate attention, especially with the obstructive hydrocephalus and papilledema. And there's more to TS than just brain stuff. Tuberous sclerosis, for those not fully familiar, is an autosomal dominant neurocutaneous disorder. It's got this whole triad going on, mental retardation, epilepsy, cortical tubers, anyone, and skin lesions like facial angiofibromas. It's also pretty sneaky. Some patients may not show any outward signs until later in life. Now, I could nerd out on the genetics here. Mutations in the TSC1 gene on chromosome 9 and TSC2 gene on chromosome 16, but I'll spare you the details. Let's just say that neuroimaging plays a huge role in diagnosing this condition. What's really fascinating is that these subependymal nodules that we see, they've got a very specific behavior in tuberous sclerosis. They line up along the caudothalamic groove and tend to enhance on MR imaging. Subependymal, subependymal giant cell astrocytomas, on the other hand, are a whole different beast. They're benign, but they've got a tendency to enlarge, and when they do, they cause hydrocephalus. They're like the overgrown houseplants of the brain. They start off fine, but then they block the foramen of Monroe, and suddenly you've got a backed-up plumbing system, so to speak. Cortical tubers, which are another feature of TS, are also commonly seen. They've got these broad, lazy appearances on imaging, and although they're pretty common, they don't always cause symptoms. What about the management here? Well, step one is getting this child stabilized. Neurosurgery might be required for the astrocytomas because obstructive hydrocephalus is not something you want to let linger. Once the child is stable, follow-up imaging of other systems, think heart, lungs, kidneys, is crucial. Why? Because TS isn't just a brain condition, it's multisystemic. In fact, tuberous sclerosis can affect everything from the kidneys, angiomyolipomas, to the heart, rhabdomyomas, to the skin, chagrin patches and unguil fibromas, anyone? So, this child is going to need long-term follow-up to keep an eye on things. Phew, that was a lot, but I hope I've managed to break it down in a way that makes this complex case a little easier to digest. Thank you for sticking with me through all the twists and turns of this fascinating condition. If you want more deep dives into radiology cases like this one, go ahead and hit that subscribe button on Radiology Made Easy. And if you'd like to show your support, check out the Buy Me A Coffee link in the description. Your support keeps this content coming. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you on the next case.